Hi, and welcome back to First Year Undergraduate Microeconomics. So far in our study of comparative statics, we have looked at changes in demand and changes in the supply curve. In this presentation, we're going to turn our attention to government policy and how changes in government policy change the outcome of markets. Before we can do that, however, we need to introduce the concept of an accounting identity. An accounting identity is something that always holds true. In other words, it doesn't just hold in equilibrium, but it always applies in a market with voluntary trade. Our first accounting identity is going to almost sound trivial, but it has really important consequences. So, given our assumption of voluntary trade, we can note that you cannot buy a unit of a good unless someone sells it, and you cannot sell a unit of a good unless someone buys it. That sort of sounds obvious. If trade is voluntary and I buy a unit of a good, someone must have sold it to me. And similarly, if trade is voluntary and I sell a unit of a good, someone must have bought it from me. But what this means is the following. For any market, at any point in time, the quantity sold of a good must equal the quantity of that good that's purchased. And the quantity of the good that's purchased must equal the quantity that's sold. Nothing to do with equilibrium. This is something that must always hold all the time in every market when trade is voluntary. Despite being obvious, this first accounting identity has important implications for government policy. We are going to look at a simple example of such a policy, a situation where the government sets the price of a particular good above the equilibrium price. This type of policy is pretty common around the world in both developing and developed countries, and in particular in agricultural markets. For many years, Australia, the European Union, the United States, developing countries like India, have had governments intervene in agricultural markets and set the prices of agricultural products, such as milk, onions, potatoes, and so on, above the market clearing level. Often, the stated aim and objective of these policies is to help farmers. But what's the real outcome? Let's look. Let's focus on an actual example, Australia's wool price support scheme that operated in the 1980s and 1990s. Let's start by considering the market without a wool support scheme or without a fixed price for wool. In that situation, we've got the demand for wool given here, and we've got the supply of wool upward sloping. The equilibrium or our prediction of what will happen in this market is given where supply and demand intersect, and that involves a price of $60 per bale of wool and 3 million bales of wool transacted in Australia. Suppose that the Australian government decides that the price is too low. It wants the farmers to receive a higher price for their wool. So it sets a price of, say, $100 per bale. What will happen? Well, notice that because the price is above the market clearing or the equilibrium price, the quantity of wool that buyers would like to buy, which is given by the demand curve, is less than the quantity of wool that sellers would like to sell, given by the supply curve. In fact, the quantity of wool that buyers would like to buy might be, say, 2 million tonnes, whilst the quantity of wool that wool growers or wool farmers would like to sell might be out here at, say, 4.5 million bales of wool. The difference between the quantity that suppliers want to sell and the quantity that buyers would like to buy, that difference is given by 4.5 million minus 2 million bales. The difference is 2.5 million bales. That is our excess supply of wool at the fixed price. Normally, if there is an excess supply, we would expect to see the price of wool start to drop. That's our dynamic assumption. But the government policy has made that dynamic assumption irrelevant because the government policy says it is illegal to drop the price for wool below $100 a bale. And this is where our accounting identity 
comes into play. If the government does nothing except set the fixed price for wool up here at $100 a bale, then the short side of a market will rule. In other words, because you can't force people to buy wool that they don't want, the amount of wool actually transacted will be the smaller of the quantity that buyers want to buy and the quantity that sellers want to sell. And in our example here, that minimum is given by the two million, the amount of wool that buyers would like to buy at the price above the equilibrium price. So the outcome of the government policy is that at the price of $100 per bale, farmers would like to produce and sell 4.5 million bales of wool, but in fact they will only be able to sell 2 million bales of wool. The government policy may have led to a higher price for wool, but it's also led to lower sales for wool. But the story doesn't end there. The government now has a problem. Consumers only want to buy 2 million bales of wool, but the farmers still want to produce 4.5 million bales of wool. So the government has to try and work out what on earth it's going to do with the extra 2.5 million bales of wool, that excess supply. Now, governments around the world deal with this in different ways. For example, one way that they can deal with it is to license farmers. The government may pass a law saying that only certain people can be wool farmers and can provide wool, and they may also put quotas on individual farmers. So individual farmers are only allowed to produce a certain amount of wool. So, for example, the government might set a quota that in total just leads to about 2 million bales of wool being produced. Those lucky farmers who get the licence will, of course, be very happy. They'll be selling for 2 million bales at a higher price. But the farmers who would have produced more wool, if the price was at the equilibrium level, well, they just miss out. An alternative approach is that the government buys the surplus product. The government may buy it and put it into storage, and that's exactly what happened with the wool surplus created by the fixed price for Australian wool, or the government may buy the surplus and actually destroy it. That's pretty wasteful, obviously. A third option is that the government may buy the surplus and then pretend it's helping farmers in developing countries by dumping the product in the developing world. And for example, the United States has done that in the last decade with regards to product in Africa. Now, the problem is, of course, that when the United States dumps agricultural product in Africa, it drives the local farmers bankrupt. So it may be a short-term benefit to the African consumers, but it doesn't help African economies in the longer term. Of course, one alternative for the government, which is sometimes followed in developing countries, is to simply ignore the surplus. Farmers who can't sell their crop at the fixed price of $100, well, tough. They just have to do something else. The actual outcome of this sort of policy is, of course, that the farmers who can't sell their product at $100 per bale are going to try and get rid of it at any price they can get. So you're going to end up with an illegal, or what's sometimes called a black market for the product, where the price is actually below the $100 and maybe more like the equilibrium price that we predict in a market without the government policy. Of course, an undesirable outcome of this policy is that the farmers who are trying to dispose of their crop that they can't sell at $100 per bale, and the buyers who take advantage of the lower price from those farmers who are desperate to sell, if they're caught, both may be fined or in some countries even sent to jail. Finally, what actually happened to the stockpile of Australian wool? Remember, the Australian government dealt with the excess supply by buying the wool and putting it into storage. Well, eventually the government decided it had so much wool in storage, it had to get rid of it. It had to start selling the wool on the world wool market. What happened? Well, that meant that 
not only did you have the normal production coming onto the market, but you had the surplus production from previous years being sold by the Australian government on the market. The Australian government managed to push down the world wool price and to hurt the very farmers who were meant to be benefiting from the wool price support scheme. And in fact, the government charged the farmers for the loss that the government made on the stored wool. So the wool farmers were made worse off for many years. This is a simple example of a government policy. One of the roles of economists is to point out the effect of these types of policies. And in the case of agricultural support schemes, the effects of those policies may be to benefit a few farmers, but more often make farmers, taxpayers and consumers worse off. Talk to you next time.